I want to tell y'all a story. It's a story about how one man used his actor's charm, conservative beliefs, and proclivity for dramatic storytelling to ascend to the highest office in the land. Actually, it's not just about this one man. It's about a few evil men who paved the way for this man to use his racism and general xenophobia to change the political landscape of America and influence conservative political parties of other very powerful nations, including, but not limited to, Canada and the UK. The way this man ruled using the blueprints laid out before him and fine tuning them for a relatively modern audience is the stuff of legends. The ramifications of this man's legacy are so ingrained in today's political landscape that once you see everything he did, everything that came before him, and everything that's happened after, it'll be very hard to unsee it. Y'all want to hear a story about why me and this bitch, who I never really liked in the first place, fell out? It's kind of long, but full of suspense. But your is ass. Let the music play. I just want to dance the night away. Yeah, right here, right here is where I'm going to stay. All night long. Ooh, 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 ooh. Let the music play. Oh, that behind me is a little bright. It's the YouTube plaque. It's way too bright, though, but <laughs> I got it. place because as I told y'all last time I moved so here we are so remember when I said you wouldn't hear lots of banging well I I lied because uh the walls in this city are like a 2000 starlet's eyebrows they're thin okay very thin so this is gonna be fun this is gonna be an interesting experience for everyone involved but we are in my new workspace I'm not sitting on a floor I should do my intro I should do my intro I'm getting too excited Hello and welcome slash welcome back to my channel. My name is Khadija, your favorite internet play auntie. Hello to all my returning nieces, nephews, and nibblings, and my fellow aunties, uncles, and piblings. If you are new, feel free to take a look around, suss out the vibe. I sit in my workspace office. <laughs> we'll figure out something to say for that. And I talk about whatever I want. Today, I want to talk to y'all about dog whistle politics. I can whistle when I inhale, but when I, never mind, never mind, never mind. Anyway, I want to talk to y'all about dog whistle politics, the origins of them, the racist roots of literal dog whistles, and the evolution of metaphorical dog whistles, specifically within the U.S. political landscape, because, you know, I grew up in the States and I'm fascinated by this stuff. We're going to talk about George Wallace, Barry Goldwater, Richard Nixon, and their Southern strategy. These are some racist white men you need to know, okay? Allegedly. We're also gonna talk about Ronald Reagan's racist ass, and I'm gonna do my best to keep my Scorpio moon in check, but I cannot make any promises, okay? Because if there is one person that makes my blood boil, it's Ronald mother Reagan. <sighs> We're gonna talk a little bit about some theory type stuff, and I'm gonna give you some examples of how dog whistles have been used in the media and in the political landscape. Talking a bit about Islamophobia after 9-11, and more recently, the wave of anti-trans legislation that's just been percolating every corner of the internet and all the things. We will talk, we will talk. But before we do that, be sure to read the description and the pinned comment for any extra information. Lots of times you'll ask me questions and the answers are in that. And let's give a quick shout out to our sponsor. By the way, I'm gonna be having a lot of sponsors, y'all. She's booked and busy, and I'm grateful for it. And also, for transparency's sake, I got bills to pay. And you think I can have a researcher, a fact checker, and a manager for free? Come on now. Also, uh, the student loan debt is real, so just get into it. It's okay, it's okay. This won't be a forever thing. Listen, we're all shopping online a lot, okay? Because it seems like it's all we can do. 
And that's where today's sponsor, Honey, comes in. Honey is a free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and automatically tests them when you're at your checkout. So like I said before, Honey is free and you can get it on your computer with two really easy clicks. Then when you're ready to check out at one of their 30,000 supported websites, all you gotta do is hit apply coupons. And wait, of course, cause it's testing coupons. You know, you know how this works. If Honey finds a working code, you'll just watch the prices drop, which sounds good to me. So I have actually been using Honey for a while now because mama loves a good coupon. And one thing that I recently used it on was actually this rug that I'm showing you. So I actually got a couple other rugs with my Honey discount code, but they haven't come in the mail yet. But yeah, isn't she cute? And I didn't have to pay full price. We love a discount. Honey supports all kinds of websites from tech, gaming, home decor, as I have told y'all, food delivery and the like. So get Honey for free by going to joinhoney.com slash Khadija. That's joinhoney.com slash Khadija so they know I sent you. And thanks to Honey for sponsoring today's video. So you know me. Before we talk about anything, we gotta define it. And as good old Wikipedia puts it, in politics, a dog whistle is the use of coded or suggestive language in political messaging to garner support for a particular group without provoking opposition. What that means is that politicians and the media will use certain words when they're talking about a particular policy or group to let their people know I'm on your side. I see you. It's like an inside joke between politicians and their constituents, but not funny and usually carries systematic repercussions. So that's not fun. Let's use an obvious example. If I tell you I listen to urban music, what type of genre or genres do you think that means? Hip hop? Rap, R&B, and the like? Now, if I tell you I live in an urban area or grew up in the inner city, what do you think I mean by that? What type of childhood do you think I had when I say that? Now, I'm just using one-on-one -on -one conversation here, and later in the video, we'll get to politicians who use this type of messaging very maliciously, but let's use a media example. When you hear on the news, another person was shot in an urban area or in the inner city, what kind of people do you think live there? What type of bodies are you picturing? And as a result, what are you inferring about the type of life those people lead and therefore what kind of help or not help those people deserve or don't deserve? Grammar is hard. If you hear 50% of suburban moms are Republican, that's not a real stat, I'm just throwing it out there. What kind of bodies are you picturing? Literal dog whistles are only audible to dogs, not humans. And metaphorical dog whistles operate in the same way. Dog whistle politics operate under the guise of what's implied but not said aloud, at least not in an obvious manner. This type of language used by politicians and the media is meant to bypass all manner of PC, snowflake, woke culture realness. Because when you're using a dog whistle, you're not saying out loud, those poor Negroes are living off the government, are too lazy to work, and as a result, white people are footing the bill. Instead, you might say something like, members of this urban jungle are taking advantage of the hardworking, tax-paying, middle-class Americans. Or if you live in Canada and the UN has censured your country because there is an ongoing genocide of indigenous women, instead of owning up to that, taking responsibility and accountability and addressing the issue, you might say something like this. The ramifications of the term genocide are very profound. The word and term carries a lot of meaning. I think the tragedy involved with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls is its own thing, its own tragedy, and doesn't fall into the category of genocide. Andrew Shear, sir what? Not Andrew Shear telling the indigenous community and all Canadians that the genocide of indigenous women and girls is its own thing, its own tragedy. People are calling it a genocide. The UN censured the Canadian government over this and he has the nerve to say that it's its own thing. It's not a genocide because indigenous women and girls are not a part of uh, the old stock Canadians as they like to call it. They're not a part of, of the, the national identity. They're their own subgroup. It's its own separate thing. And maybe that's not what he meant, but again, dog whistles, 
it's what's implied. And if you're not paying attention, that comment could slide right under you and you'd be like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. He knew what he was doing. Anyway, calling out Canada aside, because you know I love to do it. Now that we know what dog whistle politics are, let's talk about how they got started and how they evolved. So as I said before, interestingly enough, literal dog whistles have a, a, a racist origin story. Not really a surprise, but you know. One of the first kinds of dog whistles was invented by Francis Galton, who was famously known for pioneering the study of human intelligence. Y'all, he's the one we have to thank for eugenics. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know what eugenics is, it's basically hella racist science. Science. The perfect eugenics cocktail goes as follows. One part intelligence as a biological inheritance, one and a half part selective mating, because we're trying to build the perfect human race. I mean, cocktail. A splash of ableism, a dash of homophobia and general phobia of the queers and trans folks and non-binaries, you know, you know how it goes. And pouring all of those ingredients over believing Anglo-Saxon whites are the superior race. I mean, ice. Bing bang bong, sing sang song, you've got yourself the perfect eugenics cocktail. It just... <sighs> Am I getting a hint of xenophobia in this? Oh no, it's just the gin. Literal dog whistles were around before to help hunters catch foxes and birds and stuff, but during slavery, they were also used to help dogs catch runaway slaves. Those first whistles weren't completely silent to human ears though. So in the 1940s, the original dog whistle that made a faint noise was combined with Galton's, which made no noise, to create the ultimate whistle only dogs could hear. And those silent dog whistles were used by Southern police forces for no terrible, inhumane reasons at all. This is good. I mean, eugenics isn't good, but this cocktail is. As Adam Shapiro of the Washington Post puts it, it was in this context that the silent dog whistle, an invention that unified racist scientific equipment with racist cultures of dog hunting, became a technology that facilitated violent opposition to civil rights. Moving into the civil rights era, we gotta talk about Big Daddy Dog Whistle himself. No, 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 you're getting ahead, further back. Little further back, yeah, yes. George Segregation Forever Wallace. Now, if you've ever gone out of your way to learn about the civil rights era on your own time, you've probably run into this video or heard this clip at some point in your research. Let us rise to the call of freedom-loving blood that is in us and send our answer to the tyranny that clanks its chains upon the South in the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Now things are going to get interesting because here's where we sort of debunk a myth a bit. George Segregation Forever Wallace, a politician from Alabama, was not always a segregationist. In fact, when he ran as a judge in 1958, he lost to John Patterson, a candidate backed by the KKK. Wallace at that time was known as a racial moderate, or he was at least considered soft on race at that time. So much so that the NAACP endorsed him for his bid back in 1958. But then again, didn't Rachel Dolezal work with the NAACP? So like, I mean, are we really vetting? You know what I'm saying? But as the story goes, after Wallace lost the election in 1958, he famously remarked to a friend, I will never be out neighbored again. Wallace thought, I guess, that, that he could uh, you know, avoid some of the problems that we were having. He thought the Klan was unpopular, but he got beat. And that's when George Wallace in 1958 issued his infamous remark, I will never be out segregated again. Some people say he uses the N-word, and that's not a word I'm going to use, but the, he said he'll never be out segregated again. 
and he was true to his word because when he ran in four years, he uh, just became a white hot segregationist. From this point on, you really see him doubling down on this segregation shit, but it's less him constantly calling black people, I don't know, undeserving monkeys, and more so him advocating for states' rights and using the Southern strategy to gain more votes. We'll talk about the Southern strategy a bit more because there are dog whistles all up and through that idea. But what you need to know is one of the first major examples of Wallace's dog whistling can be seen in his standoff with the federal government in June of 1963. So that summer, the University of Alabama Tuscaloosa was meant to be integrated and that mandate came down from corporate. Like the federal government was like, okay girl, it's time. So they brought down U.S. Deputy Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach to Alabama to enforce this. But Wallace was like, let these bitches come. They don't know me. I will stand at this door and bar any black students from coming up in here. Y'all hoes don't know me. I am George segregation forever. Wallace, bitch. Why am I like this? Like, can you, can you answer why I'm like this? Because I can't. Phew. That part isn't the dog whistle. It's what comes next that we have to pay attention to. Now, the book that I read for this said there were 200 reporters and three national news outlets, but that number could not be corroborated by Maddie. So we're just gonna say there were hella reporters watching this. The country was watching. At one point, Wallace read some four minute speech, I guess you'd call it, emphasizing the illegal usurpation of power by the government, saying, quote, I do hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. So did you catch it? Did you hear the whistle? Yes, Wallace was known for denouncing integration and that was his central goal, but yelling racial epithets at black folks, it was falling out of favor in the public eye. Doesn't mean it was falling out of favor with people behind the scenes, just, you know, it wasn't too cute to be saying that on national television, you know what I'm saying? So instead of saying, we don't want Negroes in this school, he says, do hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. Ergo, states' rights. Wallace was saying we don't want blacks in here, but using states' rights as his main point. And with that argument, you couldn't outright say, this man is being hella racist. Especially if you had no context for his ideas. If you didn't, you could say, he just wants us to let the states decide what they want to do with their laws. And the federal government shouldn't be disrupting the sovereignty of individual states. That doesn't sound racist. That sounds like democracy. Aside, he was one of the first candidates to start talking about law and order, which is another great dog whistle we'll get into in a bit. Not great, but you know what I mean. You were, you were quoted as having observed once that the people know the way to stop a riot is to hit someone on the head. Yes, sir, I, I, I've said uh, something similar to that. When somebody goes out and begins to loot and burn a building down, which endangers the health and safety of everybody, that's a good way to stop it. Uh, if you let the police know, uh, let the police knock somebody in the head who was breaking a plate glass window, or uh, who was assaulting a policeman, who was assaulting a, uh, a person on the street, or uh, throwing a firebomb, I think they'd be getting out mighty light if somebody knocked them in the head. And frankly, that's exactly what ought to be done. And if I were the president of the United States, I would take whatever was necessary to prevent what happened in this city if we had to order the knocking in the head of many people. And when you do that, you're going to satisfy the overwhelming majority of people of all races in this country because it's not a matter of race, it's a matter of anarchists, and the government has kowtowed to every anarchist group in the United States, and as a consequence, we don't have any safety in the streets of our large cities, nor right here in Washington, D.C. Well, this kind of sneaky political messaging got into the hands of some other terrible old white men, and they used it and the Southern strategy to turn these dog whistles all the way up. So briefly, the Southern strategy was an appeal by Republicans to get Southern white voters on their side using race baiting tactics. It's kind of what we can look to to understand how the Republican and Democratic parties, one, became so divided, and two, how the South went from mostly Democratic to almost exclusively Republican, particularly in the last 20 years or so. Not me being a, a political correspondent. Not me being a political correspondent. Hello. <laughs> Up until 
until the 1960s, the Republican and Democratic parties weren't seen by individual voters as one side being more for like civil rights than the other. I mean, Brown v. Board of Education was backed by Republicans. But in 1964, a man named Barry Goldwater would use this Southern strategy to race bait his way all the way to 1602 Pennsylvania Avenue. Not 1600, because he never actually won the election, but he set a precedent that would enable Nixon and Reagan's bitch ass to fine tune their racism with the help of some good old fashioned dog whistles. So the Southern strategy was a numbers game to Goldwater because he was wealthy and he didn't want the government to be all up in his money. You remember how I said last time, follow the money? Yes, you see, you see. So he realized in order to gain more power, AKA votes, you had to get the South on your side. And in order to get the South on your side, you had to appeal to racist rhetoric. I wanna just quickly add that the Southern strategy wasn't just about race, particularly as the decades went on, as we'll see later on in this video. It was more so about politicians zeroing in on a current hyper-visualized, marginalized community and seeing how they could stoke fears, moral panics, and all around ignorance to get Southern white voters on their side and voters all over the country that were white and felt the same way as them secretly. And to get Southern white middle-class voters to vote against their own economic interests. But hey, <laughs> that's capitalism, baby. <laughs> Give me a little bit more of this. Just a second now. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's a nice color. So Goldwater sets his precedent in 1964, but only ends up winning five deep South states running as an independent. And then Richard Nixon picks up where he left off in 1968, but is way smarter about it. Because again, it's becoming less cute to be overtly racist. So Nixon uses this Southern strategy and these dog whistles to appeal to white voters in a few ways. He comes out against force busing, which is seen as another way to integrate schools, causing white flight in a lot of neighborhoods. And then he starts really hammering away this idea of law and order. It is time for an honest look at the problem of order in the United States. Dissent is a necessary ingredient of change. But in a system of government that provides for peaceful change, there is no cause that justifies resort to violence. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. He's painting civil rights protesters as criminals and vandalists as a way to move the conversation away from civil rights and towards order. Demonstrators ended up becoming stripped of their morality. These weren't humans fighting for their right to exist and achieve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They were criminals that needed to be stopped by the police. Now, where have we seen this message before? Lynchings became replaced by incarceration and this whole idea of civil disobedience really became a talking point for Nixon. This man was out here committing whole ass crimes and was worried about black and brown people fighting for human rights. The audacity of some white man, it's, <laughs> it's astounding. It's literally the definition of worry about yourself. Don't worry about what I'm doing, worry about yourself. Mm. Tricky dick. That's what they called him, tricky dick. Anyway. In the 1970s, Richard Nixon leaned into this racial division, slowing down Southern integration, straight up throwing Mitt Romney's dad under the bus. Cause what had happened was George Romney was the secretary of housing and urban development. So he was implementing plans to get Southern states or to force Southern states to get this integration shit going. Cause they were taking their sweet ass time. But the South was none too pleased with that. So Nixon, ever the spineless demon toad, said this in December of 1970. I can assure you that it is not the policy of this government to use the power of the federal government or federal funds in any other way, in ways not required by law for forced integration of the suburbs. I believe that forced integration of the suburbs is not in the national interest. Bitch, if you don't, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cool down because we still have to talk about Ronald Reagan's bitch ass. But before we do, I wanna leave you with a quote that I think really summarizes the Southern strategy 
and how it uses dog whistles or used dog whistles both to harm everyone involved. <clears throat> what is the Southern strategy? It is this. It says to the South, let the poor stay poor. Let your economy trail the nation. Forget about decent homes and medical care for all your people. Choose officials who will oppose every effort to benefit the many at the expense of the few. And in return, we will try to overlook the rights of the black man. Appoint a few Southerners to high office and lift your spirits by attacking the Eastern establishment whose bank accounts we are filling with your labor and your industry. George McGovern, lost to Nixon in 1972. America don't want anything that's good for it. Most of these countries don't, damn. Something you should know about me. It is not in my nature to hate anyone. There have been people that have done some pretty terrible things to me and it's still just not my vibe, with one exception. Ronald mother Reagan. The rage I feel in my heart for this undeserving, untalented, useless waste of a human flesh suit is unrivaled. Second only to his wife, the spacey, smiling like she has some sense of reality when really she's smiling because she knows she's helping Satan do his work, domesticated dumbbell of a human. And I use human in quotes because I'm pretty sure she's Beelzebub's mama. Where was I? Yes, the Reagans. The couple who ruined the lives of so many and whose actions many communities are still facing the repercussions of today. Now, Nixon and Goldwater were not great, but Reagan was even more conservative than both of them, if you can believe that. Reagan was a big supporter of Goldwater's presidential bid in the 1960s, reciting a speech in Goldwater's support that gave Reagan the attention and leverage he needed to eventually become governor of California. He was also against the civil rights movement, against forced integration, for law and order, and for housing discrimination, stating, if an individual wants to discriminate against Negroes or others in selling or renting his house, he has the right to do so. It's amazing how people will use your right to do whatever you want as a right to hate people for no reason, just because they were born that way. It's fascinating, really. Some of y'all really don't hear yourselves when you speak, but whatever. All these examples aside, the biggest you minorities dog whistle Reagan used came in the form of his 1980 introduction to America as their Republican nominee for president. In front of a sea of smiling faces chanting, we want Satan, I mean Reagan, Reagan spoke to the mostly white crowd at the Neshoba County Fair in Mississippi. And I know what you're thinking. Good Egypt. Yes, maybe they were all mostly white. But what's wrong with that? It is the South after all. No because just a mere 16 years earlier, Neshoba County was where three civil rights workers, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner were murdered, sorry, <laughs> beaten and shot by the KKK for trying to help black people vote in that state. So no, Henry David Thoreau, this was not some innocent announcement that just happened to be in one of the most racist counties in one of the most racist states in the Confederacy. I mean, United States of America. Wow, I chose violence today. This was Reagan standing in front of 10,000 white folks proclaiming, I am the state's rights hunty. In the Reagan's documentary that I watched as part of the research for this video, one of the commenters said that states' rights in the South has always meant that the North can't tell us what to do and that the federal government can't say black people are equal to us. Get that equality shit out of our faces. She didn't say that. I was just, uh, I was just ad-libbing for emphasis. Yeah. Anyways, besides his campaigning for states' rights and his aversion to integration, Reagan was also widely against the welfare system, which interestingly enough is pretty tied up in integration, but we'll talk more about that in a second. What you need to know for now is that Reagan was really about this bootstraps, meritocracy, colorblind individualism. He wanted less government involved in people's pockets, particularly the wealthy 1%, and a way to achieve this was to give tax breaks to a lot of them because all this extra money these wealthy people were getting taxed on was going to this blood-sucking welfare system. At least that's how Reagan saw it. 
America needed to slash funding to these programs and slash it fast. So if you're Reagan and you're saying all of this, you're like, sweet, I've got the rich on my side, but how do I get lower class and middle class whites to vote against their own interests? How do I get them to help cut funding to these programs? No! The first dog whistle he used in the context of welfare wasn't so subtle. Reagan would go around talking about how some strapping young buck in line ahead of you would get a T-bone steak with his welfare while you were waiting in line to buy a hamburger. Now, if you saw my digital blackface video, you know that buck was one of the staples of blackface minstrelsy. He thought, he was being slick, but the North remembers. So because this language was a bit too obvious, Reagan changed it to some young fellow, but the messaging was still the same. These people, minorities, are out here taking advantage of innocent white people's hard work and they gotta be stopped. The second dog whistle Reagan employed was his tale of the welfare queen. He didn't give her that name, but... Now the woman in question was Linda Taylor and she wasn't a person with a high moral compass, let's say. Actual accusations of homicide and kidnapping were against her. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say that. But those didn't serve Reagan's narrative of why welfare should be cut off. So they mostly avoided talking about that and just talked about how she was an example one of many of how minorities, particularly black women, use the welfare system to unfairly and lazily take advantage of hardworking white folks. And just like that, he got lower and middle-class whites to prioritize their ideological ignorance over their economic interests. As Ian Hanny Lopez puts it in his book, Dog Whistle Politics, the Forbes 400 richest Americans enriched by the Reagan tax cuts tripled their net worth from 1978 to 1990. Under Reagan's tax policies, the process of transferring wealth from the poor and the middle class to the rich and especially to the super rich began with a vengeance. Now we've just done like a kind of brief overview of dog whistle politics. There's a lot more there that happens during Reagan's presidency with regard to the war on drugs, the crack epidemic, HIV AIDS epidemic, the forming of a more centralist democratic nominee in the form of Bill Clinton and all of his tough on crime, war on drugs nonsense. And of course, Bush and Obama and Trump. <laughs> but I wanna step into some theory stuff. God, this video is gonna be so long. Oh. oh. I want to step into some theory stuff and talk about three distinct categories of dog whistles and give some examples within those that really drive all of this history and context home. Now, Ian Olsov, writer at Vox, says that you can divide dog whistles into three categories. Semantic, contextual, and stereotype dependent. So I'm gonna actually define what he says each of those categories are and then put examples that I think fit best because to be honest, the article was a bit confusing. It was just dense and I was like, I don't know which example is fitting in here. They all kind of bleed into each other, but yeah, we'll just define them first and then give some examples. Now, semantics are just the way we dissect the meaning of a word. The example he uses to kind of explain this is that if there are two spies at a table and they have a code word salt, which means once I say salt, take out the target. If I am the spy and I say, can you pass the salt to the other spy? They know what that means. But to the random person sitting at the table with us, the target, they might not know what that means. And a real life example that we can use of that is the way the media and the president talked about Muslims during America's war on Muslim, I, <laughs> I mean terror, whoops. After 9-11, America saw a sort of reimagined McCarthy era surge in nationalism. And that put into question who was American and who wasn't. And if you were coded as Muslim or from the Middle East, you were no longer part of the national identity. Some would say it was anti-American to be Muslim or coded as Muslim. America had this us versus them fixation against the axis of evil and those axis we're brown folks. 
Axis of Evil was a phrase George Bush was really, really fond of during that time. It was, damn, everywhere. And this is where we get into the danger of dog whistles because after 9-11, hate crimes against people coded as Muslim went up 1600%. Eventually they did go down, but in the year 2001, they did, they did rise that high, 1600%. What? Because you hear things like war on terror, you hear axis of evil, you hear Taliban and all of these things. And even if they are real things, real words that people are used to, there's an implication underneath that phrase, war on terror, war on the Middle East, war on Muslims, because it's their fault 9-11 happened. And also you can see this a lot in the way films were. I talked about this a bit in my TV's new political agenda about how television and movies, how just like the film industry changed a lot after 9-11. And one of the major themes of that change was seeing brown folks as terrorists in a lot of movies and just this weird nationalism of the American hero, the soldier that's gonna, that's gonna combat the Taliban and all of this stuff and, and any time anyone that was coded as Muslim or coded as from the Middle East, or even if you were South Asian and let's say you were Sikh, if you even had like a turban or anything, people were like, you're Muslim, ah, you know, like watching films like that, you see this just, this surge of, of heroic white American men standing up for the, for the, the little guy. And it's actually interesting. I, I was listening to uh, your wrong about recent episode about the Dixie chicks and how Natalie, said, you know, they were ashamed the president was from Texas, they didn't agree with the war and people burnt them at the stake, especially country music fans, and we're all pissed off and saying the worst things to them. And it's so interesting how now people like to forget how, how insane the nationalism was. Like, I remember, we always had to say the Pledge of Allegiance, like that was always a thing, but I remember such a difference when I moved to Canada of being like, Y'all don't have a thing that you say to the flag every morning to pledge your allegiance to your nation? Wow. It, that's wild. That is the pledge. Wild. Anyway, sorry. I also just want to point that I grew up Muslim. Because I'm black though, it's kind of interesting. I don't know if in America people assume that black folks are Muslim. I don't really think that that's a thing, especially because I didn't wear a hijab growing up. But I do remember going to Sunday school and summer Sunday school and having the other girls that I went to school with just to Sunday school, just being a bit nervous and being worried about what people would say and do to them. And I was self-conscious about it because I was like, okay, people don't assume that I'm Muslim. So I'm just not gonna wear the hijab and I'm just gonna make sure that people don't know because clearly people don't like us and I'm not trying to be a part, you know, like, and I was able to obviously do that because I didn't look Middle Eastern and people, don't know that Islam is a really popular religion in, in West Africa, parts of Africa, whatever. Anyway, and, and not even in parts of Africa. Malcolm X was Muslim, but you know what? We're not talking about nation of Islam. Let's stop, let's stop. But anyway, semantic dog, <laughs> semantic dog whistles. With stereotype dependent dog whistles, we've already touched on this. That's the welfare queen. You know, the stereotype is that black folks are lazy, particularly black women. They take your money. They don't want to work hard for anything. And you, the hardworking, tax paying, innocent white person has to pick up the slack. So we don't have to go too deep into that one, but the contextual one kind of fits all of them. All three of them kind of lead together. But the example that he initially uses is how in 2017, some anti-Semites on the internet were using the word coincidence to, to mean a Jewish conspiracy. These people ended up being found out and exposed, so it didn't really work anymore. But Olasoff ends up evolving this category of dog whistle stating that most dog whistles don't work in this way. This way meaning that the context of how dog whistles are used and the efficacy of them is derived from the larger context where they're most comfortable. Like an expression. Expressions make for good dog whistles because they can be associated with certain groups, 
or the typical way that they're used in our language can have a secret code woven into its history. There's an emotional charge that comes with certain expressions and one of them that seems to be getting a lot of, of use these days is women and children, particularly amidst the wave of anti-trans legislation in America and the UK. Now with the expressions thing, there's this, uh, ideal of semantic prosody that's that's working in here. So if you're just learning English, the phrase women and children, it just sounds like nouns describing two groups of people. But if English is your first language or your primary language, you know the linguistic history of that expression and the emotional charge of that expression. When you're thinking about women and children, there's this helplessness, a need to protect people who fit into that expression. And according to America in the UK, trans people don't, don't, they just don't. When you hear talk about bathroom bills, there's this ridiculous grandstanding by politicians about how we need to protect real women from predators and, and creeps pretending to be trans women. Yet, those are the same politicians who would rather force a real woman to give birth to a child she doesn't want and refuse to put economic safeguards in place to help her raise that child if she can't afford it. They'll say, protect our children. Don't let trans kids play sports. But those are the same ones that are pro-gun. Those guns that people use to shoot up the same schools that your children that you want to protect go to. And because this dog whistling, fear mongering, moral panic is based in conservative values, just like in the 80s, you see people who lean to the right voting against their own interests, except this time it's not just economic, it's political. If you're so worried about protecting real women, giving more women access to safe abortions might be a good place to start. If you're worried about your child's safety, it's much more valuable to you to ask for gun reform than it is for you to worry about whether or not a trans child can play on your girl's soccer team. All of these dog whistles, semantic, stereotype dependent, contextual, at the end of the day, it doesn't even matter which categories these fit into because they're all serving the same purpose. It's these politicians and the media on both sides, actually, I leaned heavy on the right, but either way, using secret coded language to get their message across, to secretly communicate with their base. And it's really harmful because if you try to call it out or say anything, you're a you know, PC snowflake, why is everyone so sensitive about anything? When you're really just pointing out the nuance and evolution of this ignorant and xenophobic language. And like I said before, racism and all of this stuff, it doesn't just disappear out of nowhere. Just because people aren't black people does not mean that mass incarceration is not a thing. Do you know what I mean? And this is just gonna bleed into my final thoughts, but it's more so me just talking more about the importance of context and history and why this video is so damn long. The reason that I think the context and history is so important, particularly with dog whistles, is because it's important for us to know that none of these policies are brand new, just like none of the people that they're weaponized against are brand new. Because of the hyper visibility of queer people, non-binary folks, trans folks, there's a counter attack happening where the right and just anyone that's obsessed with a gender binary really sees their values and their way of life being threatened. So they have to attack. And typically when that happens, the most visible marginalized groups are also the most vulnerable. We saw this during the Chinese Exclusion Act. The Holocaust did not happen because Hitler was bored, okay? We saw this during the civil rights era, during second wave feminism, when gay people started fighting for rights, then with Islamophobia, with immigration, now with queer communities, and I'm sure there are many others that I missed. But either way, this fear of difference and the subsequent moral panic lobbied against disenfranchised groups is always there, under the surface waiting to be dug up. It's how George Wallace was able to rise to the rank as governor. He even said, you know, I started off talking about schools and highways and prisons and taxes, and I couldn't make them listen. Then I started talking about neighbors 
and they stomp the floor. It's how Goldwater and Nixon were able to take that template and run with it. It didn't really work out for Goldwater and Nixon was his own worst enemy, but Reagan was able to really perfect those dog whistle tactics. And we all know what the last four years under Trump was like. Sorry, my upstairs neighbors are doing a lot, but this evolution of xenophobic fear mongering is always gonna be around. But it's important that we as people who want to allow others to live their lives free of discrimination and hatred, simply for existing as the highest expression of themselves, it's important that we know what these malicious tools are so that we know how to handle them. It's important to know that history so that we know, hmm, where have I seen this before? Okay, okay, you went slick. We can call out dog whistles, and I don't mean throwing that word around like how we all throw out gaslighting and narcissists, but I mean paying attention to the language people are using. Question them and question yourself. We live in a time where information abounds. It is everywhere. We have access to it all the time. And it can just be easier to be told what to think than to come to your own conclusions. And dog whistles are so sneaky that you might not even know that you're being told what to think. Philosophy Tube's most recent video went into some great philosophy about this concept and I would suggest y'all check it out. I'm gonna put the link in the description. But the gist of it and the part that had me being like, yes, was when she said, if you don't do the thinking, someone else is gonna do the thinking for you. And I love that because don't let anyone, including me, do the thinking for you. My intention here is to always share with y'all what I've learned, but my perspective is gonna be biased because that's, it, it's filtered through my lived experience. But my hope is that through watching these videos, you'll consider a perspective you maybe hadn't before. And through that newfound or ignited curiosity, go on your own and seek out other information. Find that information, find those sources so, so that you can come to your own conclusions. That's why I always like to put links of my work cited in the description below so that you can see, hey, this is what I read. If you want to read it, cool. If you don't and you want to do something else, that's totally cool too. But Yes, as always, because this video is probably 7 million years long. The links to my work cited will be in the description below. And it's great to be back, y'all. I missed you. It was only a couple weeks, but I was like, oh, I miss making videos. So, yeah. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about South Asian stereotypes. Yes, we're doing research on that. And then after that one. The reason I'm saying this out loud is because I have to hold myself accountable. After that one is, is I think it's, no, two weeks after that is going to be the tire video. There's another video in between that that I think will be really good. But yeah, Whew. we made it. If you made it to the end, amen to you. We haven't done a teacup emoji in a while, so drop a teacup in there. Because, yes, it's been a minute. As always, feed your plets, water your plets, and remember that you can always change your mind because you can, and I will see y'all next week. Bye. But in 1964, um, Goldman, it's Goldwater. Are they like in my room? I can hear these people in my room and forbid this eagle. Now in us all soft, all soft, all soft. All is off. I just want my hair. Like I love a messy look, but it's just, you know what, it's fine, whatever. Whatever. Okay. Whoops. Ah, is it a bright ah or an ah like father? I'm <laughs> such a singer. Okay. Good job. Good job, Khadija. Had to change shirts. Just had to. It was, you know, I can't wear white. I'm too dark. I can't wear a white shirt and expect the lighting to be perfect. <laughs> I was gonna say gold in the whole video. Okay. I'm not good enough at that yet. Anywho, okay. <laughs> Where was I? Oh my god, okay. Fine tuning them for a relatively modern audience is the. Sh okay. Okay, I'm doing way too much. <laughs> this is a fancy thing. I need to not drink too much of this. I put too much gin in here. I really need to stop watching Drag Race. The way this man ruled using the blueprints laid out before. Stop, you're talking so fast. Okay. I just want my hair to just cooperate. That's all I want. You know what I'm saying? I need to drink this thing. Oops. I'm gonna take this off the wall. This is reflecting too much. Yes! Oh, this is gonna cut me off. Why is it gonna cut me off? Did I already use too much? I don't think I'm asking for too much.
too much? I don't think I am. Am I asking for too much? This is cute. I want to show off more of my crop top. More of my crop top. Exactly. Cannot be talking to my hair. Crop destroyer. <laughs> okay, settle down, PJ. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Oh my 